Hey there, once again, YouTube. So it has been a little while. You know, I am starting to work full time now and I do have that baby coming soon. So family first, but you know, I still am monitoring areas very, very closely. So I do have some things to bring to you today. This is going to be a pretty long video and there's a lot of stuff to talk about with a very little time. So if the video is too long and you just want to skip to something, please look at the parts section in the description box below and that should help you get to the info that you want to see. Starting off, let's talk about Steamboat Geyser. Now, for those who watched for Steamboat Geyser eruptions on the Seismic Station Y and M, you probably missed it today. I almost missed it. Definitely almost missed it. But here we are at Y and M. And by the way, right now, 6.36 p.m. Pacific Time, October 1st, 2019. Happy October. We do see Steamboat erupted right here with uh, some more... Well, you know, we do see a big burst at first. With a lot of these eruptions, there's like a burst of an eruption, then it calms down for a couple minutes, and then a smaller eruption occurs, but is much longer, but is smaller. And that's pretty much what we did see here. So I did update my Steamboat Geyser page. Let me move over. Every single time I see Steamboat Geyser erupt, I always update the page. And the most recent eruption is the 38th Steamboat Geyser eruption in 2019, which is officially the 70th eruption since it reactivated in 2018. It seems to be smaller in amplitude than other eruptions of 2019. However, the stream gauge near Steamboat Geyser does suggest that it did put out a good amount of water. And we do see now the spikes are either footsteps within the Norris Museum or rocks being thrown from the eruption. I believe it is footsteps. I believe they are footsteps, but that's just, that's for additional interpretation. But we do see the Steamboat Geyser eruption happened here. Here's the main burst and it's slowly erupted for, I'm going to say probably a good hour afterwards. It is a lot smaller. But, again, Steamboat Geyser did erupt. I almost missed it. However, I noticed this right here was not indicative of normal background activity that we see every day at the Norris Museum. So I went to check the, here, let me refresh this page, the stream gauge uh, near Steamboat Geyser, which detects any and all water that flows through that stream. And we do see the last eruption was on the 25th, and we do see an eruption today. So a little bit less water was put out than the one on the 25th, but it still put out a good amount of water, so Steamboat Geyser is still active. Now if the audio is skipping in this video, please forgive me. For some reason, something's going on with my computer, so just try to bear with me. Now we, we did have an interesting event in Washington State. Notice up here, just north of, north, northwest of Wenatchee. We did see a magnitude 1.9 other event. Yeah, that's interesting, not an explosion. Not a quarry blast, but a 1.9 other event at negative 1.2, negative 1.2, excuse me, kilometers in depth. All the way up here in the mountainous area. Notice that. North of Wenatchee. Right here near Roaring Ridge, which is just about 11 kilometers west of Entiet, Washington. Now, something to note on here with this strange, strange event. We're going to take a look at it in just a second. However, let's go to origin, and I do want to show you something interesting. So the location uncertainty, it's pretty good. So they pretty much know where it occurred. However, look at the depth uncertainty. Plus or minus, obviously it wouldn't be plus in this case, but minus 31.6 kilometers. Plus or minus, actually. So it could have been 31 point, or excuse me, it could have been 32.8 kilometers in depth. Or it could have just been natives 1.2 kilometers of depth. So they really don't know. Uh, yeah, very, very intriguing why the depth uncertainty is so large. I don't think I've ever seen a depth uncertainty that large before. But it, to me, it does look like an earthquake. However, you'll see why they labeled it as other event. Let's take a look at that right now. I pulled up some plots. I did make some plots for you guys from three of the closest stations to this event. Now, SLF in the UW network was the closest seismic station to feel this event. Looks like a normal tectonic earthquake. Looks run of the mill. However, once you get into the second and third and beyond closer stations, you see something very weird take place, guys. Notice how there is a clear P wave arrival on all of these, which is the first wave to show up on any seismograph for any event, whether it be seismic or surface noise or whatever. The P wave is the first wave, no matter what. Okay, second, we do see an S wave arrival right about here. Notice that. We see the P wave starts to die down, and boom, we do have an S wave arrival. However, what is this? There's a third increase in energy that is not a surface wave. That is not a Love or Rayleigh wave. So, very strange how there are three arrivals, actually. There's a P and an S and an unknown arrival. So, the way that this 
event propagated away from the source shows me that that's why they labeled it as other event. I have no clue what the heck this was, but it sure was a very strange magnitude 1.9 event in eastern Washington, just west of Entiet. Now, here we have Texas, past seven days, magnitude 2.5 and above. And we do see that there's a magnitude 4.0. Notice that at five kilometers in depth on September 30th, 2019 at 2147 UTC. Now, there was also an earthquake, a two, minor 2.6 at 4.7 kilometers in depth down here on the 25th. But I want to focus on this 4.0 right here. Very, very intriguing. It had multiple aftershocks related to this sequence. And then there was a 3.2, kind of near Fort Worth, just southeast or so of Fort Worth in Texas. But we're just going to take a look at the waveforms real quick and the frequency content of this magnitude 4.0 in Texas. Very, very, very intriguing. 140 people reported feeling this event, guys. So it was definitely a good-sized earthquake for Texas, since they usually don't have that many earthquakes of this size. I'm going to say maybe strike, slip, earthquake. I don't know, though. I don't know. I'm still not great at looking, or excuse me, at understanding moment tensors. So we'll figure that out later. But for now, I'm going to say it's probably primarily a strike, slip event, I believe. Probably I'm going to be wrong about that. Again, 140 people reported feeling it. Now, just real quick, there was a new study that finds faults under Texas are sensitive to earthquakes. A new study shows that faults lying underneath North Texas are sensitive, and if disturbed, earthquakes could happen. And this 4.0 uh, earlier did occur in kind of northern Texas, pretty much. The study led by the University of Texas at Austin included researchers from UT's Bureau of Economic Geology, Stanford University, and Southern Methodist University. Together, they created a comprehensive map of more than 250 faults, totaling more than 1,800 miles in combined length. Some of the fault lines extend under highly populated areas in the DFW region. Researchers said that the faults are relatively stable if left undisturbed, meaning that they probably won't ever have major earthquakes or anything like that. But that wastewater injection, a practice common during oil and gas operations, significantly increases the potential of the faults to slip if not managed properly. That means the whole system of faults is sensitive, said lead author Peter Hennings, a Bureau Research Scientist and Principal Investigator at the Center for Integrated Seismicity Research, CISR. The study was published in July 23rd in the issue, uh, in the most recent issue, excuse me, of the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America. Here we have data from SN02 in the TX network broadband vertical, 00 location code. I'm going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter just real quick. Just to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. Now, here we do see the magnitude 4.0 in Texas, which I probably would not be surprised is related to wastewater injection. In my opinion, it does kind of look like a fracking earthquake. Fracking earthquakes typically are very short. In e For how large this earthquake is, the PNS wave arrival seem very, very short. And from what I've seen in the past, fracking can cause earthquakes that look like that. I'm not, I'm not a professional at it, but... It does kind of look like it's caused by wastewater injection. Wouldn't be surprised, but I could be wrong. Multiple, multiple aftershocks around the magnitude 0.5 to 1.0 range that probably were not reported. However, the larger ones, like this one, I believe was reported as well. Let's look at this one. Yep. And that one right there. And this one was definitely reported. Here, let's see if I can pan this down real quick. There we go. I believe this was a 3.8 in the same location, I believe. Same type of earthquake, it looks like. And you can tell there are multiple, multiple other earthquakes on this day in this location. So this area did see a good increase in seismicity. And as of the most recent data, we only see a few more microquakes here and there. And that's pretty much it. So moving on. Now, just for an update on the volcanic activity on the Big Island of Hawaii, we do see seismicity still continues within the Mantopun conduit underneath Pahala, Hawaii, between about 20 kilometers to 50 kilometers in depth. It's pretty deep. A lot of these earthquakes are occurring. Spasmodic tremor has been minimal, if any at all. There have been a couple, which I'll show you in just a second, even though the most recent also was a few hours ago. But really, over the past month or two, spasmodic tremor has calmed down significantly. Prior to this, it was occurring like once or twice a week, maybe even more than that. But uh, you could definitely tell spasmodic tremor has been calming down. But seismicity 
seems to be probably maybe increasing with some interesting low frequency events showing up at Kilauea over the past 24 hours, which I will show you in just a little bit as well, showing that volcanic activity is still alive and well underneath the big island of Hawaii. And the ground continues to swell and inflate at the Mauna Loa summit right up here at the Kilauea summit and along the Kilauea East Rift Zone. So we are seeing still three areas on the Big Island of Hawaii that are still actively uplifting, meaning they're swelling because of a new influx of magma. The magma is not necessarily rising into uh, onto the surface yet, but eventually it will reach a breaking point. Eventually it will. It can't just sit down there and inflate forever and ever. Who knows when that will be? So let's take a look at spasmodic tremor, which has only pretty much only occurred a few times. And again, if you guys wish to know what volcanic spasmodic tremor is and its relation to the volcanic activity on the Big Island of Hawaii, please look in the description box below under links, and there should be a link there uh, to my website, a page on my website about spasmodic tremor. One of, it's one of my most favorite seismic events to study when they do occur, and they have been pretty low as of late. We do see here, and let me zoom out a little bit. Some strange type of spasmodic tremor, actually. It does not have the higher frequencies that we usually do see. Ignore the earthquakes. These two are earthquakes. Right here is the spasmodic tremor I am talking about. Right here. Very, very strange, guys. I I don't know. It is very, very weird. But if we go to HUAD, right here, and go all the way back. Let's see. When, when was this? Let's see. 2248 on the 3rd. Let's go to the third at 2248. 2248. Come on, buddy. All right, let's get rid of those background microseisms just real quick. I think it'll probably take a 1.5 hertz filter to do that. Come on, man. Take it too long. Come on, baby. There we go. Okay, so now this station that I'm showing you right here is on Hualalai Volcano, which is far to the northwest of Mauna Loa. Now, notice how, here, let me try to move this around just a little bit. Notice how we do see it here, obviously, right? On the 3rd, at around 2236 to about 2306 or so. And then on here, we do see the same event at the same time. So that's how you can confirm that spasmodic tremor has occurred, because sometimes spasmodic tremor can look like a surface event. So just take a station that is many, many, many miles away where it's impossible for the same surface event to appear on, and just correlate the times, and if they both correlate, try to use as many stations as possible, and if they all correlate, basically you found yourself spasmodic tremor. So, that is that. Now we did see another one recently. On September 26th to right about the end of the 26th, uh, we did see two spasmodic tremor events. And as you can see right here, let's see if I can capture it. Don't know what's taking so long. There we go. Let's go to the spectrogram, shall we? Now, this is a typical spasmodic tremor event, which I've documented countless and countless times on my Hawaii blog, on my website, and also that new page that I put out about what spasmodic tremor is. This one was interesting, lasted from about 1711 UTC and ended, I'm going to say, at about 1744 UTC. So about about 32 minutes long, so and not too strong either. Just a typical run-of-the-mill spasmodic tremor event. And we did see kind of a weird splotchy, in-and-out kind of spasmodic tremor event right here, which is very weird looking. That is the weirdest spasmodic tremor I've ever seen. But we definitely do know this one is spasmodic tremor, very, very typical of the ones I've studied in the past, which you can find many examples of, again, on my website. Now, going forward, and let's go all the way forward throughout all of these earthquakes. Come on. All right. Here's the most recent data, actually. Right here is the end of the data stream at about 7 UTC, or excuse me, about 7 p.m. Pacific time, October 1st, 2019. So many hours ago... Uh, we did see spasmodic tremor right here. Notice this. Here, let me try to move forward a little bit. Uh-oh. Come on, buddy. There we go. Another typical spasmodic tremor event, but it was extremely, extremely weak. Here, let me try to go to, let's see, let's try 100 amplitude count, which is very, very weak. There we go. You can kind of see the increase in energy right there, but basically the most notable one recently was on the 26th. So spasmodic tremor has been very, very minimal lately. Now, enough about spasmodic tremor. Let's talk about the weird seismicity that started to occur in the past 24 hours 
at Kilauea. Now remember, at the beginning of this month, I believe it was on September 3rd, excuse me, the beginning of last month. Sorry, I forgot it's October. At about, on about September 3rd, I believe it was, we did see for about a couple hours, we did see a rhythmic drum beat earthquake swarm of low frequency earthquakes at Kilauea. It was coming from somewhere underneath the Kilauea summit. And I did look at that in one of my recent videos. I don't know which one it was. Just go check it out on my, uh, on my channel. Go to videos. Um, so let's look at what's been happening today. Here we have CPKD, which is very close to the southern rim of the Kilauea Caldera and Halemaumau Crater. Now notice how there wasn't too much of a rhythmic activity prior, um, prior to the 1st, but once October 1st hit, at least the UTC day, October 1st, notice these little teeny, 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 tiny earthquakes down here at the bottom. Now most of them really, I guess, uh, let's look at the dominant frequency, shall we? So it, it doesn't really go past 10 hertz, I guess. It can somewhat be labeled a low frequency event, a lot of these little teeny tiny earthquakes, but I don't know. I, uh, some of the frequencies go a little too high. Go a little, some of these go past 15 hertz. So I don't know exactly what type of earthquakes these are, but they are rhythmic, as you can see from the helicopters, but they're weak. And I mean very, very weak, guys. I mean, some of these are well below background levels like for example let's go to one of these you can barely even make that one out right there i mean they're so tiny guys so so very tiny and here's the most recent data as of 707 p.m actually right here would be 704 p.m pacific time and it does seem like it still continues again these are very weak events but they are occurring nevertheless and somewhat in a rhythmic fashion so it's very interesting. The seismicity of Kilauea lately has been very weird, guys. Very, very interesting, that is for sure. Now I'm going to open this up. Let's see if I can zoom out. Notice that? Notice how they look very rhythmic. Very small, but very rhythmic. Let's try the same thing on WRM. Let's see, what is the zoom out time? The zoom out is 2400. Let's set the zoom out to 2400. Press OK. Let's go to the spectrogram. And what was it at? It was at about, I'm going to say 1430 UTC. Let's go to 1430 UTC, right about here. And notice if I cut out the, excuse me, let's see here. And that's, wow, I, that was really not working out. Okay, here we go. Okay, so you see these rhythmic beats right here, right? Notice that? All right, well, let's go over here to another neighboring station, which is actually a little... A little bit farther away from CPKD, about a mile or two, I believe. And we do see the rhythmic drum beat pattern here as well. Except it doesn't carry too much of a rhythm. But we still do see many of these tiny, tiny rhythmic earthquakes still are occurring at Kilauea. So we know volcanic activity is alive and well underneath Kilauea. And I don't know when it will erupt again. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's sometime in the next couple years at the max. So we'll just have to keep a very, very close eye on Kilauea. Hope you guys like that. Now let's move on to something else. Now here's the main thing that I wanted to talk about today, starting on September 12th. Actually, September 11th, um, September 12th, there was, between those two days, there was a little bit of seismicity, but mainly starting on actually the 13th, September 13th. There is a big burst in seismicity, a large rapid fire swarm with magnitudes not really surpassing magnitude 2.9, 3.0 or so. Uh, but still, there were so many earthquakes in that first swarm just within that one day, within about a 10 hour period or so. Now, I am making an analysis page on that uh, when I can get up. I don't know. I'll try to get it up by tomorrow, but you know how busy I am. I will try. Now, since September 13th, to right now, October 1st, so that's less than a month, there have been 855 reported earthquakes of all sizes. Yes, for Long Valley Supervolcano. Now, as we can see, Long Valley Supervolcano is this entire area right here. Uh, let's see, you can see the indentation right there. Notice that. This indentation is the caldera of an old super eruption. And they're still rumored to be 240 cubic miles of magma within its magma system. So it's still a potentially active, very dangerous supervolcano. 
Now, near Mammoth Lakes, which is in the south southwestern portion of the caldera, again, we saw a large outbreak in seismicity. Magnitudes were not large, but the, the way they were occurring was pretty crazy. Very energetic, guys. Multiple earthquake swarms making up all of the seismicity in less than a month. Again, 855 earthquakes of all sizes in less than a month for just this one patch. This one tiny patch. Now, it doesn't seem like it's tiny, but compared to the magma system and how big the caldera is, this is a tiny patch. So, I believe it is related <clears throat> to fluid migration from the magma system. And as you will see in a second, these earthquakes are basically occurring at the ceiling of the magma chamber and a little bit above the magma chamber as well. So, whatever's going on, there's some sort of interaction with the magma system going on here. I don't know exactly what... But we're going to take a look at some of the info regarding this large increase in seismicity for Long Valley Supervolcano. Now let's go to largest magnitude first. Out of all the seismicity in less than a month, the largest was a magnitude 3.0 at 5.3 kilometers in depth, which apparently some people did report feeling. Very interesting seismicity, guys. 11 people reported feeling this earthquake. Very, very intriguing, guys. Very intriguing. 5.3 kilometers in depth. So right around the depth of the top of the magma chamber or so. And you'll see that in just a second. Now, this magnitude 3.0 basically occurred with the second rapid fire swarm that is making up the recent seismicity near Mammoth Lakes around this depth. So it's very interesting what's going on there. Um, again, this is part of the second swarm, and we did see multiple swarms part of the sequence, such as the September 13th rapid fire earthquake swarm with a crazy amount of earthquakes occurring in very, very rapid succession, guys. It was quite an intriguing earthquake swarm, one that I have not seen at Long Valley called there for quite a long time. Very, very energetic. So many earthquakes sometimes blending together. And notice we had more down here on the 13th as well. Whoops, sorry, it's glitching out a little bit. More earthquakes, more earthquakes. Definitely, probably, I'm going to say over 500 during this day, but they only reported about 250, so that isn't too bad. Going forward, we saw seismicity calm down later in that day, and then it looks like it picked back up again. Notice that we had more rapid fire swarming in the same exact location the next day, actually. Sort of calmed down a little bit, a little bit of rapid fire swarming down here, but pretty much calmed down for the most part. And then we did see that it picked, whoops, that it did pick back up again. More rapid fire swarming on the 15th, actually. So, and look at this, guys. Look at the rhythm right here. Look at that. Boom, 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 boom. Very, very rhythmic, some of these events. Not really constituting a drumbeat swarm. It's a little short, but if this were going on for, like, over an hour, then I would definitely be concerned. Um, but no volcanic or harmonic tremor has been detected along with these swarms, which is a really good sign, thank God. So, and now, another part of the swarm occurred on September 25th, and it was not as strong. It did not have as many events, but it was close, and some of the magnitudes were actually a little bit larger, with multiple magnitude 2.5s, 2.6, and even a magnitude 3.0 thrown in the mix. So, yeah, guys, it was definitely, definitely very, very active recently for Long Valley Caldera. Um, when I do my monthly updates, uh, which I will try to get out by next week, hopefully, it's going to look like there's a lot of earthquakes in September for Long Valley Caldera, guys. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Again, almost all that you see here are earthquakes. And it kind of calmed down later on the 25th. Still earthquakes popping off here and there. A few earthquakes here and there, here and there. And up until the 27th, it's been pretty calm. Pretty calm. And let's move on to the next few days. And from September 27th onward, again, still at Station MEM, which was one of the closest seismic stations to the earthquake swarms at Mammoth Lake, we see seismicity did continue pretty strong. Well, not too strong, actually, excuse me. Um, and then kind of calmed down on the 28th. And then we did see a slight increase. A few more earthquakes did occur on the 28th. And then on the 29th, boom, we did see more rapid fire swarming, guys. This is what we did see the most recent of the rapid fire swarms right here, which is still um, taking part of this whole weird increase in seismicity in kind of like a circular fashion um, in the eastern section of Mammoth Lakes, which is in the southwestern section of Long Valley Caldera. Again, a super volcano with a lot of magma down there, guys. 
very, very energetic earthquake swarms still taking place, but it seems like it's, it is calming down because each subsequent, sw subsequent swarm, excuse me, from the 13th to now has been getting kind of weaker and weaker and weaker. So whatever's going on there could be ending or could just be starting. We don't know. I don't know. Let's move forward. Again, some small earthquakes here and there. It still continues. Small quakes, small quakes. I wouldn't be surprised if we did see another rapid fire swarm in Long Valley in the next few days. I would not be surprised. So keep an eye out for that if that does happen. Again, nothing too crazy has been occurring the past day or two. Um, and this is the most recent data down here. We did see another earthquake or two. Two earthquakes actually looks like right here. Most recent data. That's at about, let's see, that's 711 p.m. Pacific time would be right about here and it's 7 36 p.m. Pacific time right now October 1st 2019 so very intriguing the seismicity that is occurring at Long Valley Caldera guys so yeah seismicity is picking up there now I did want to tell you guys that I did make some notes about this let's see um, a lot of these notes that I did write down are for the analysis page. This is basically like an outline that I make for every analysis page that I create on my website. So here's some notes that I've noted about this earthquake swarm, multiple swarms actually, part of this whole sequence since uh, September 13th. The majority of the seismicity for Long Valley in September was in the eastern section of Mammoth Lakes, the south-southwest portion of Long Valley Caldera. Between that time period, there were actually, the, the, the since the 13th, I'm going to say, since the 13th, there were 839 earthquakes reported during three separate swarm episodes. 51 earthquakes reported were above magnitude 2.0 with only one magnitude 3.0. The largest earthquake was a 3.0 at 5.3 kilometers in depth during the September 25th earthquake swarm. The swarm was non-linear in formation. This does not seem to be tied to local tectonics. Tectonics may still part play a part, excuse me, in this swarm. It is likely that fluid migration from the magma system is the culprit. About three eighths of the swarm was at five kilometers depth or deeper. The top of the Long Valley magma system is around four kilometers to five kilometers in depth and descends deeper. So basically, about three eighths of the swarm was occurring within the magma system like actually within the magma chamber itself or uh, within the roof. So the the ceiling of the magma system could have been cracking. It could have been cracking, maybe becoming exposed to the rock around it. And the, the rock around it was becoming even heated more than it's used to. So that could be what caused this earthquake swarm. Or it was fluid migration from the magma system itself. I don't know for sure. But here's something very interesting to note. Now, here is a cross-section of the earthquake swarms since... September 13th. Now, we do see right here, here are the depths of the earthquakes right here. The magma system ceiling is right about here. I have the line just below the five kilometer mark, but it could be anywhere from right here to right here. But you can tell, now we are looking north, by the way, right now, right in this cross section, we are looking north. Um, kind of imagine you're underground at five kilometers in depth and you're looking straight to the north, right through the magma chamber. That's basically right where we're at right here. Um, so yeah, this is the magma ceiling, uh, system ceiling depth is right about this location right here. So you can tell, and the fact that this earthquake swarm was non-linear, meaning it did not occur basically on any um, linear fault structure, which is what we should see if it was purely tectonic, and it's not. Here we are at the interactive 3D earthquake viewer, which I will leave a link to this in the description box below. You guys can play around with this if you want. This is the swarming that has been occurring at Long Valley at Mammoth Lakes since the 13th. And you can tell, again, up here is north. Looking that way is north. And here it is, right here. Notice it kind of looks round. Notice that? To me, that indicates that something was going on with the magma system ceiling, the ceiling of the magma chamber. I don't know what, guys, just putting out some theories, but it is very intriguing how it is non-linear. Notice that? And most of the earthquakes are around the same depth, actually. And the farther you get to the north and to the northeast, it seems to descend a little bit deeper. They're a little bit more shallow to the southwest and seem to be a little bit deeper to the northeast. You notice that? See that right there? Looks a little bit interesting. So I don't know what was going on with Long Valley, guys. Again, you can come here and play around with this if you want. This is an awesome tool. I love it. I love it. I use it all the time. 
So there it is right there. So keep an eye out for another earthquake swarm appearing on Long Valley called there in the next few days to the next week. I believe it probably will see another one soon. And oh yeah, I almost forgot. Here we are at volcanoes.usgs.gov. Just going to show you the another type of depth time plot that we are going to be dealing with right here. Let's zoom into the Mammoth Lakes region, which has been seeing the majority of seismicity as of late for Long Valley Caldera. Again, you can tell it's very concentrated compared to the rest of the caldera, which barely is seeing any seismicity at all. So let's go over to the right and click Earthquake Plots. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to select a plot area. We're going to select a uh, spot right up here, which will be A, and a spot right down here, which will be B. Notice how all 1,000, actually all 900 or so, they say 1,222 earthquakes in the past month have been located around Long Valley Caldera. That's a lot for one month. However, let's move on. So let's click View Plot, and it's going to pop up this plot right here. This is a time depth plot here. Let me zoom in a little bit. This shows the depth of the events, the depth beneath uh, sea level, actually, in miles, not kilometers, in miles and the date right here. So notice we saw the 13th and the 14th seismicity right here. Then there was this bit of a space. Then we saw September 25th through 26th, some more seismicity, and then some more seismicity uh, a few days ago as well. So it's very intriguing, guys. What's going on with Long Valley Caldera? Let me know what you think. All right, for, for this uh, article right here, now, you can go into the description box below and click the link for this New York Times article. I don't like to use New York Times, but this was a good article that they put out, surprisingly. Um, moving on. Now, it's very interesting what they talk about in this article, which was posted on September 9th, 2019. So if you don't want to go through with this, uh, go through this article with me right now, you just want to read it yourself, skip the rest of this video, go ahead and do that. This is the last part of the video. You can just read it yourself instead of just listening to me talk. Okay, moving on. Seth Moran, and not Moran, excuse me, Seth Moran, excuse me, sorry about that, Seth. I have emailed Seth a few times. He's a cool guy at the PNSN, uh, is worried about Mount Hood. In the 1780s, the volcano rumbled to life with such force that it sent high-speed avalanches of hot rock, gas, and ash down its slopes. These flows quickly melted the snow and ice and mixed with the meltwater to create violent slurries as thick as concrete that traveled huge distances, called lahars. They destroyed everything in their path. Today, the volcano, a prominent backdrop against Portland, Oregon, is eerily silent. Well, except for a few months ago, it was not silent, that's for sure. But, moving on. It won't stay that way. Mount Hood remains an active volcano, meaning that it will erupt again. And when it does, it could unleash mud flows not unlike those from Colombia's Nevada del Ruiz volcano in 1985. There, a mud flow entombed the town of Armero, killing roughly 21,000 people in the dead of night. On Mount Hood, any little thing that happens could have a big consequence, said Dr. Moran, scientist in charge of the Federal Cascades Volcano Observatory. And yet the volcano is hardly monitored. If scientists miss early warning signs of an eruption, they might not know the volcano is about to blow until it's too late. Determine, eh, you know, I can kind of see that. that. That could kind of be true. However, really, if there is severe seismicity, kind of like at Mount St. Helens, we'd pretty much know. However, that's not the point of this article. Moving on. Determined to avoid such a, a tragedy, Dr. Moran and his colleagues proposed installing new instruments on the flanks of Mount Hood in 2014. Those include three seismometers to measure earthquakes, three GPS instruments to chart ground deformation, which Mount Hood really needs bad, and one instrument to monitor gas emissions at four different locations on the mountain. Woo, let's put those up, Seth. Come on, man, you can do it. But they quickly hit a major hiccup. The monitoring sites are in a wilderness area, meaning that the use of the land is tightly restricted. It took five years before the Forest Service granted the team approval in August of this year, 2019. Explain to me what would have happened and what would have gone through the heads of the Forest Service if Mount Hood erupted during that five-year time span. So what did you do to help mitigate this situation with the Mount Hood eruption? Well, we just sat on our hands and hoped that it wouldn't blow. Really? Like, really? The approval is a promising step forward, but Dr. Morin and his colleagues still face limitations, including potential legal action. 
that may block their work. Are you freaking kidding me, guys? This article, wow, pissed me off. Now, it wasn't the article or the writers that pissed me off or Cascade Volcanoes Observatory. It was the people saying that we shouldn't put seismometers on mountains that are going to blow eventually. Really? Do people not understand what a volcano is? Now, such obstacles are a problem across the United States where most volcanoes lack adequate monitoring. Although federal le legislation passed in March could help improve the monitoring of volcanoes like Mount Hood, scientists remain concerned that red tape could eventually leave them blind to future eruptions with deadly consequences. Now, the United States is home to 161 active volcanoes, many of which form a line along the west coast through California, Oregon, and Washington, and Alaska. Seven of the ten most dangerous American volcanoes are in the Cascade Range, and six of those are not adequately, excuse me, adequately monitored. In contrast, countries like Japan, Iceland, and Chile smother their high-threat volcanoes in scientific instruments. Well, duh, at least they're doing something right. The U.S. really doesn't have anything to this level, said Eric Cometti, a volcanologist at Denison University in Ohio. Yet, there's no question that better monitoring could save lives. Volcanoes don't typically erupt without warning. As Mount St. Helens awoke in May 1980, a series of small earthquakes could be felt on the surface nearby. Shortly thereafter, the volcano started to deform. Steam explosions sculpted a new crater while a huge bulge emerged on the volcano's north flank. Earthquakes continued, landslides rumbled, and ash-rich plumes erupted all before the main event. Hey, Seth Morin, woohoo, you go, my friend. My goodness, you go put those seismic monitors up there. If someone told me I couldn't put seismic monitors on a potentially eruptive volcano just because they don't want to put human interactions up there or human limitations in wilderness, are you kidding me? It's going to hurt people. Literally, if, if a volcano erupts like it did with Mount St. Helens, let's say Mount Rainier did exactly what Mount St. Helens did. The Lahars would be 10 times worse, and if we had those seismic monitors in place, we would be able to tell people, okay, this is what's happening, this is potentially what could happen in the next few hours, next few days, next month, you know, but if those monitors are not there, we're blind. So I don't understand people's reasoning, I like, at all. Although... Although not all volcanoes follow such a steady pre-eruptive pattern, they typically either tremble, deform, or belch volcanic gases, meaning that if scientists monitor these three signals, they will be able to forecast when a volcanic eruption will happen. And guys, volcanic eruption forecasting has really gained a lot of traction in the past 10 years. A lot. Take Hawaii as an example. Shortly after earthquakes picked up at the Kilauea volcano on April 30th, 2018, scientists at the HVO could tell that they were not only increasing, but they were also propagating to the east. That was not only cool, it was vital for emergency management, Dr. Morin said. Scientists used those signals to project where magma might erupt, and planners evacuated residents in that area. The eruption destroyed more than 700 homes, but remarkably nobody died, and it was all thanks to 60 seismic stations located across the island. Without those instruments, we would have been blind, said Tina Neal, the scientist in charge at the HVO. While we would have known something was happening, we would have been less able to give guidance about where and what was likely to happen. Dr. Morin and his colleagues had that example in mind as they pressed their case for adding instruments to Mount Hood. They submitted a proposal to the Forest Service in 2014, but the instruments, which will be housed in four feet tall boxes with radio antennas and solar panels on the outside, violate the Wilderness Act. Dude, they're four feet tall boxes. What? Which prohibits any new structures and even noise pollution within federal wilderness areas. I see the Wilderness Act as nature's bill of rights, said George Nickus, the executive director of Wilderness Watch, a conservation group that opposed volcano monitoring. Opposed volcano monitoring in federal wilderness. Opposed volcano monitoring. Are you insane? Uh, 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 oh, oh my god. Okay, I think it is so important to have places like that where we can just step back out of the respect and humility, and appreciate nature for what it is. Yeah, I'm sure people did that during the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. In reviewing Dr. Morin's proposal, the Forest Service provided the public with an opportunity to comment, during which they received more than 2,000 statements. Most of the statements agreed that the wilderness needs safeguarding. Are you, uh, People are so... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. 
People are so incompetent when it comes to volcanoes. Like, really, guys. Oh, man. Oh, man. Moving on. Moving on, guys. We just need to move on. Otherwise, I'm going to be ranting all day, all night. To Jonathan Fink, a geologist at Portland State University who also wrote a public comment in favor of volcano monitoring, this argument is misplaced. Thank you, Jonathan. That's very true. I'm all for protecting wilderness. So am I, guys. So am I. Dr. Fink said, but this is just a question of public safety, and I think letting a helicopter in to put some instruments in that can then be monitored remotely seems like a pretty minor exception to the wilderness policies. Even so, many critics argue that we can't even make a single exception, or there won't be wilderness at all. Wait, so if we put some seismic stations in, then all of a sudden we're going to be building cities on top of these volcanoes? Really? Real Okay, okay, I need to stop ranting because this got my blood pumping that people are just so incompetent about volcanic hazards. I mean, it's going to blow up in their faces, literally going to blow up in their faces. It's not a wilderness if you have structures, if you have roads, if you have motorization. In fact, it's anti-ethical to the whole idea of wilderness. Oh, man. Other critics say the project is far from necessary. If we can do something like land one of those landers on Mars, we can move a few miles back from a volcanic feature and monitor it from a little further away. Huh. But Dr. Morin and others argue that the work is not possible unless they get up close and before the volcano begins to rock. Amen, Dr. Morin. Amen. The name of the game is to be able to detect and correctly interpret these warning signs as soon as possible to give society as much time as possible to get ready. When Mount St. Helens first began to rumble, scientists couldn't tell if the quakes originated under the volcano itself or five miles away at a nearby fault. They only had one seismometer two miles to the west of the volcano, so they rushed to place more instruments on its slopes, a risk that would not be allowed today. And within days, they knew the volcano itself was shaking. Looking back on it, it's really miraculous that they were able to do what they did, Dr. Morin said. Wow, look at that volcanic eruption, guys. Scientists have since learned that we don't always get as much time as Mount St. Helens allowed. At Caboco, a volcano in southern Chile that's similar to the volcanoes in the Cascades, all was quiet during the early afternoon of April 22, 2015. But tremors began in the late afternoon. And by 6.04 p.m. local time, the mountain was sending a plume of gas 10 miles into the sky. Less than a day of precursor warnings, guys. Less than a day. That, see, that puts even more stress on the fact that we need these instruments up there. And we need a lot of them, guys. And they wouldn't get in the way of bears. They, I mean, bears might check them out for a second, move on. They're harmless. They just sit there. I mean, we're not building cities up there. I mean, really? Come on. With such a narrow window, the first line of defense is to have a solid monitoring network in place whenever a volcano awakens. You're going to either get in there ahead of time and put in the instrumentation you need, or you're just going to accept that you're going to go blind into the entire erupted period, and whatever happens, happens. Although none of these volcanoes appear to be building toward an eruption today, there's no question that they pose a serious hazard. The USGS has a deep understanding that these volcanoes are going to erupt again, within our lifetimes and within our children's lifetimes. The evidence is all there. Beyond Mount Hood, Mount Rainier near Seattle could also unleash viscous volcanic mud flows, called lahars. There, 80,000 people live in the path of disaster, and yet the mountain only has 19 instruments, which scientists say is not enough given its vast size. Now, I do, you know, I think 19 instruments is good for Mount Rainier. Yes, it does need more, but I think that's pretty good. That was a bad example for them to put. They should have talked about Glacier Peak, which they do in just a second. But really, Glacier Peak, yeah, it's in desperate need, and it can produce some of the most explosive eruptions in the contiguous United States. Yeah. Meaning the ability to throw enough ash into the air to halt traffic for days or even weeks and cost billions of dollars, it has only one size monitor. One. And Glacier Peak, likely during its next eruption, will erupt larger than Mount St. Helens did in 1980. Yeah. Glacier Peak is the only other volcano, basically, in the Cascade Range that could produce such huge eruptions like Mount St. Helens. I mean, Mount St. Helens could produce some large, large ones. It's the type of magma involved that has to do with its eruptive capability. 
All right, moving on. Without equipment to detect the eruption, airplane passengers just might find themselves living in a high-altitude nightmare. In 1989, a Boeing 747 flew through an undetected ash cloud in Alaska. All four engines shut down, and the airplane went into a nosedive. It descended 13,000 feet before the pilots were able to restart the engines. Hundreds of thousands of people fly across the West Coast and above active volcanoes every day. Eruptions in Alaska and California would also be felt across the nation. Anchorage is a ma major cargo hub, meaning that many FedEx or UPS packages travel through Alaska. But an eruption might bring that to an alarming halt. And because California produces a large portion of the nation's food, an eruption might limit the fruits and vegetables found at supermarkets as far as the East Coast. We're not just doing this for academic purposes. This is so that we can give good information to emergency managers. And that's the end in all of this. And apparently people don't give a crap. Despite the permit's recent approval, Dr. Drager notes that there are still a number of steps before any instruments can be placed on Mount Hood. They will now have to choreograph the assembly of instruments, hire personnel, and schedule helicopter trips around weather and other potential obstacles. Moreover, the Forest Service and the Observatory could still face a legal challenge from Wilderness Watch or other groups that adds years to the installation, if not blocking it altogether. This is more proof that the Forest Service has abandoned any pretense of administering wilderness as per their letter or spirit of the Wilderness Act. Oh, and Mr. McFarlane, whose group is discussing litigation with an attorney. Really, they're going to sue the Cascade Volcano Observatory for putting seismometers on a volcano that could erupt and kill people? Are these people... Please, in the description box, or excuse me, the comment box below, please tell me how absolutely insane you think these people are to stop seismic monitoring or any type of monitoring at all of any volcanoes. I, I just... It's... It, it, uh... Oh, man. And then there is more work to be done monitoring other hazardous volcanoes beyond Mount Hood. Volcanologists across the nation were pleased this March when Congress passed the National Volcano Early Warning and Monitoring System Act. Woo! Congress did something good! Yay! Which seeks to ensure that volcanoes nationwide are adequately monitored. Yay! Doctor, while they wait, Dr. Morin and his colleagues will hold their breath, hopeful that these volcanoes stay in a deep slumber, but aware that one just might arouse at any moment. Alright, guys. So, interesting, interesting, interesting. <clears throat> okay, so, the National Volcano Early Warning and Monitoring System Act. This act may be titled as the, oh, there's the title, okay. The Secretary of the Interior shall establish within the United States Geological Survey a system to be known as the National Volcano Early Warning and Monitoring System to monitor, warn, and protect citizens of the United States from undue and avoidable harm from volcanic activity. The purposes of the system are to organize, modernize, standardize, and stabilize the monitoring systems of the volcano observatories in the United States, which includes the Alaska Volcano Observatory, California Volcano Observatory, Cascades Volcano Observatory, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, and to unify the monitoring systems of volcano observatories in the United States into a single interoperative system. The objective of the system is to monitor all the volcanoes in the United States at a level commensurate can we commensure it with the threat posed by the volcanoes by upgrading existing networks on monitored volcanoes, installing new networks on unmonitored volcanoes, and employing geodidic and other components when applicable. The system shall include a National Volcano Watch Office that is operational 24 hours a day and 7 days a week. Wow, that is pretty cool, guys. It's it, That hasn't been created yet, but one of these days we're going to have a website like that we're just going to go to and get... Updates from the government about volcanic eruptions. So that's going to be pretty interesting. A National Volcano Data Center. Look at that. A National Volcano Data Center. Wow. I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited to see what that's going to entail, guys. I, I'm really, I'm really like, this is Christmas for me. This is, oh man, I'm really excited to see what that's going to entail. But they're probably going to have some goodies in there. That's for sure. An external grants program to support research in volcano monitoring, science, and technology. So yeah, guys, yeah, very, very intriguing. They did pass a law, and it actually passed. Woohoo! So that's basically it right now. Let's see if any large earthquakes or any weird stuff has occurred while I have been talking, which sometimes it does. Let's see here, nothing too crazy right now. So that's about it. Sorry this video was long. I just had a lot to talk about in, 
in what, 49 minutes? Man, 49 minutes, guys. Well, that's it for right now. Let me know what you think. God bless, and I will see you guys later.